Good evening. My name is Melissa Giller. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you for joining us this evening. In honor of the men and women around our country who defend our freedom, may I ask you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. During remarks to the students and faculty at St. John's University in New York on March 28, 1985, Ronald Reagan said, when I took office four years ago, America was in a crisis. Government was weighing all of our people down with excessive personal taxes, business taxes, and meddlesome regulations. In 1981, we rolled up our sleeves and applied new thinking to these by now old problems. We cut tax rates for all individuals and businesses. We passed tax, tax indexing so that inflation wouldn't force your parents into ever higher brackets as their income increased. We drove inflation down to below 4%. We got the economy moving again. Economic growth. After all, John Kennedy had done what we had done, and great growth followed. We're here tonight to learn more about the similarities between the JFK and Reagan revolutions. Free market principles of limited government, low tax rates and a strong dollar, once put in place by the bipartisan wisdom of both Presidents Kennedy and Reagan, are needed again to fix our current woes and to get back to a time of a thriving economy. Of our two guests, our first guest is Lawrence Kudlow, a CNBC senior contributor who is also a nationally syndicated radio host. Our second guest, Brian Domitrovic, is a historian, professor, and senior associate at the Laffer Center for Supply Side Economics. Together they have written JFK and the Reagan Revolution, a Secret History of American Prosperity. So let's get to it, ladies and gentlemen, Larry and Ryan. Well, thank you, appreciate it. Great crowd, jeez. I guess you're from around here, you must be. We just did flu flew in six hours worth. Nice drive. I'd forgotten what LA traffic is during the. <laughs> so, so it's a pleasure, and again, thank you for coming, uh, Brian Dmitrovic, and I. Um, how long did it take to do this book? You told me it took three years. Yeah, a little under three years. Yeah. The only thing worse than writing a book is, is selling a book, marketing a book. I just want to tell you that in case you're thinking about writing a book. <laughs> and I will say this: uh, honored to be here because. Um, uh, I was once uh, one of President Reagan's budget deputies. I was associate director for economics in his first term. And along with a guy named John Rutledge, who's a very, very dear friend of mine, we were, we were the guys during the transition who did the numbers to figure out what it was going to cost and how much the economy would grow. And um, everybody beat the hell out of us, uh, all the media people, press people. And it was great because we were right. We were right. <laughs> and, and actually, I'm just ad living. It's not, not in the book so much, but I just felt like talking about Reagan. I don't even know how old. I was probably 30 years old. Uh, as always the case for me in jobs I've had down through the years, I was completely unqualified to be a senior guy at OMB. But it all worked out. And the thing that's important is regarding President Reagan, in the tough days before the program really gelled into economic growth, and it really took about 18 months to pass the legislation, to wade through the um, Volcker conquest of inflation. Reagan never wavered, never wavered. It's just interesting. One of the things I learned as a very young man, you know, if you believe in something, stick to it. And he believed in it, and, um, and he stuck with it. I, I'd say about a third to a half of his own senior staff didn't believe in it. But it didn't matter to him. He just sort of brushed it all off. And that was one of his great leadership um, qualities. So in terms of this book, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time. Brian and I and other friends of ours, there's about seven or eight supply siders left now, um, or at least lively, or at least those who admit it. And um, we're, we're two of those seven. Art Laffer is one. He's in our acknowledgment, uh, who's kind of the father of us all in some sense, and Steve Forbes and Steve Moore. And, a few others. 
And the interesting thing is, you know, Reagan was derided and beaten up for the idea of lower tax rates, better rewards after tax, and hence um, incentivizing the economy, rejuvenating the economy so people would want to work and work harder and people would want to invest and take risks and start new businesses. And that model, the incentive model for growth, uh, was Reagan's key point. And the key point of our key point is that Reagan essentially borrowed it by his own acknowledgement from John F. Kennedy. And this is a story that I don't, we, no one else has uh, done this story in, in the kind of detail that we went through it. You know, and if you're inclined, you can skip the economic pages. It's really a historical narrative is what we have here. In fact, I think we, we're number one in economic history. Oh, yeah. Amazon, yeah, it's just the right place for us. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, it turns out, and I'm going to let Brian describe some of this, but I'm just going to give you the outline. There are three heroes in this book. Uh, one is John F. Kennedy. Another is his Republican Treasury Secretary, a fellow named Douglas Dillon from a well-to-do banking family. He was a Republican, Eisenhower's Undersecretary of State. And the third one is Reagan. You could put sort of 3A and put Jack Kemp in there because... Kemp had been crusading for lower tax rates to rejuvenate the economy. <clears throat> and I actually moved into that circle. I was a Wall Street economist in those days. And Kennedy, or Kemp basically just says at one point, and we have it in our book, when he's meeting with his staff, you know, well, geez, why don't we just use, du duplicate was the word, why don't we just duplicate JFK's tax cuts? And um, Kemp sold it 30% reduction in tax rates for individuals and companies, and he sold that to President Reagan, who uh, I, I wasn't there at the time, but apparently didn't need a whole lot of selling. But Reagan then, of course, carried that through thick and thin and wrote it to victory in uh, 1980. So you really have to go back to Kennedy. And I, one reason I like this book is because, I don't know if you've ever had the New York media experience, but they don't really agree with us very much. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it's any better out here. Uh, in fact, I suspect it's not. Uh, you, you have to really kind of look for the cities and towns with the deplorables. Find the deplorables, <laughs> and, and they'll be more understood. Did I say that? It's not, this book is not about this election, exactly. But that's the thing. And, Democrats have basically written JFK's tax-cutting legacy out of their history, which is a pity. Um, you know, Mrs. Clinton, uh, whose husband, by the way, was really more in tune with JFK once he got a Republican Congress to stand with him. Uh -huh. But Mrs. Clinton is, you know, running on big tax hikes across the board, and you'll see the first debate in a week or so. And the rest of the Democrats have moved far to the left, themes like redistribution and inequality, not growth. And that's really too bad because, speaking as a former Democrat, as late as the mid-1970s, I was helping Senator Pat Moynihan, who remained a lifelong friend until he passed away. A lot of Moynihan Democrats in the Reagan administration. Reagan himself, of course, was a Democrat who voted four times for FDR and once for Harry Truman. And he said he voted for uh, Nixon. I don't know. I don't know if that confirmed completely, but he said he voted for President Nixon. But in any event, um, there's no reason why both political parties today couldn't generate a large-scale, bipartisan, pro-growth tax reform program. I think the issue today is rather more business taxes uh, because we're not competitive internationally. Our own businesses are leaving and they're taking their cash with them. But the point is that Kennedy was a Democrat and Reagan was a Republican. They both ran the same policies and it succeeded. That's really the key point. It worked. And for all those on the other side of the aisle, and academicians who hate this stuff and so forth, they, they just won't confront the fact that it worked. And my own view, you know, I've been kicking around economics for a very long time in different capacities. Um, I started the Fed a million years ago and worked on Wall Street and worked for President Reagan and came back to Wall Street and wind up becoming a full-time 
radio and TV broadcaster, but I don't really care what your 5,000 equation econometric model tells you. I only care what history tells you, that there's some things that work and some things that don't work. And history will dictate that. Just read it, look at it. And that's the tragedy of the loss of the JFK idea. Most of his own family members don't agree with him and never talk about him. In fact, I'm already getting some, some, uh, some counterattacks. No, no, it wasn't really like that. You guys are wrong. Of course it was like that. We even have the tax rate tables in the book, I think. It's, yeah, it's still in the book. So this is really a story about bipartisan tax cuts and how they work. And the application today, I'll leave it to you, but I think we're overdue, and there's no reason why you couldn't do it again under the right circumstances. Secondly, in the bipartisan idea, it's a story about how JFK, who had three Republicans in his cabinet, senior cabinet jobs, not you know, some of the outer boroughs there in the cabinet, but I'm talking about his defense secretary was in those days a sort of run-of-the-mill moderate Republican who ran the Ford Motor Company. That was Robert McNamara. Uh, secondly, his national security advisor, which is a very big job, was McGeorge Bundy, who was a Republican. And thirdly, Doug Dillon, uh, the banker, was a Republican. And I would like to see a president copy that model. You know, put some strong people from the other side into your cabinet. So we can do away with all this incredible partisan name calling, which is driving me crazy. You can't even hardly have a discussion anymore without name calling. I see it on my, my tweet, my Twitter uh, world. You know, it's about 100,000 people coming into that thing. And th they'll be taking wax at me, which is fine, but not on the issues, on personal. You know, I'm an idiot, I'm a jerk, I'm washed up, I'm faded, or whatever they say and it gets uglier than that. Um, you know, I just wish we could be more substantive. And um, you know, I'm myself probably in the back nine of, of life, but I think that if I have any shot at saying anything, and a lot of it comes out of this book, is the idea that we can work together. Reagan did too. Remember, Reagan passed the tax cuts in 1981 with roughly 70 Democratic votes. In those days, they were called bull weevils. They were moderate Democrats from the Midwest and the South. Very important factoid that is sort of lost to history. And um, in 1986, when Reagan moved towards the larger tax reform bill, taking the top rate from well, 70 to 50 in 81 and then down to 28 uh, percent, he had massive majorities, Democratic majorities. People like Bill Bradley and, and Dick Gephardt. Uh, and many others, Sam Nunn, uh, people who are all sort of lost to the Democratic Party today, and it's a pity. So I strive for that. Uh, you know, on the radio, I talk about this a lot. And uh, I'll read tweets on the radio from people who are beating me up for these ideas. And now, because of our book, I can just say, well, just read the goddamn book. <laughs> because it was a Democrat that started this stuff. OK? That's the most fun of all. So um, that's kind of the story here. And persuasion, stick to the issues. You can be bipartisan. I don't have to call you names. I'd rather talk about the issues and persuade you, or at least let us go back in time and look at the evidence. These are like lost arts in American politics, and it's a pity. And Republicans, regrettably, are probably just as guilty as Democrats. You know, we saw a lot of that in the primaries uh, and, and so forth and so on. Um, in the House and the Senate, with some outstanding exceptions, some outstanding exceptions. But so often the dialogue is just so um, snarky and insulting. And I, I don't really think that's any fun. I think that's the reason why a lot of people are turned off to politics. They don't like this election. They don't like much of anything that's going on. So that's a sort of broad outline. I want Brian to t talk to us about growth, the importance of economic growth, which itself is becoming a lost idea. We can't keep growing at 1% to 2% and think this country is going to be the greatest country on earth. We can't. And one last thing before I turn, I meant to do this, but um, like Reagan, JFK argued that in order to have great leadership abroad and the resources to fund it, Kennedy was a fierce anti-communist, 
you have to grow at home. You have to grow at home. And when I was a kid working for President Reagan, you know, in these budget meetings and stuff we'd have, I mean, we were in there a lot in the first couple years, but he made the same assertion, he made it in his speeches. If you're weak at home, you're weak abroad. If you're strong at home, you're strong abroad. I don't know why that's so hard to understand, you know? And this idea of secular stagnation is completely wrong. It's really an un-American thought, you know? Not, I don't want to accuse, some of my best friends are liberals, come on the shows and so forth, but the reality is we cannot do what we've been doing. And I might add, in a bipartisan sense, we've been doing some bad stuff for the economy for about 15 years. It didn't all happen in, in, in Obama's terms. A lot of it did, but he wasn't alone. And Republican Congresses and, and Democratic Congresses and presidents and so forth, they've stopped paying attention to growth and understanding the linkage between uh, strength at home and strength abroad. And I think, you know, these hideous people coming out of the Middle East who want to destroy us, um, they see our weakness. They see our weakness. And that I can't stomach. I just can't stomach. And um, as an aside, I'm just waiting for a presidential candidate or some major figure to just say, we, the U.S., declare war on ISIS. Right? You've declared war on us, and we declare war on you. It should come from the United States. It should be a, a joint resolution from Congress. And then it should come from NATO. And then we should just simply say, we are going to destroy you. And I'll tell you an anecdote real quick. Um, a couple weeks back, say, sequentially, I had Kissinger one week. I had Mr. George Schultz the next week. And then I had General Keene, General Jack Keene, the third week. And I asked them somewhat leading questions. But I asked them, and I know them all very, very well. Um, Henry's been great to me down through the years. So has George Schultz. I said, do you think the United States should declare war against ISIS? Each one of them said, yes. Yes. And, you know, Kissinger is not known, you know, as, you know, ravaging neocon Warhawk trigger puller, neither is George Schultz. Um, and Jack Keane is, um, you know, tougher as a former military man. Then the next question is, shouldn't we set out to destroy them? And just say that. Just say that. And Kissinger, Schultz, what you have to do is destroy their safe havens in Iraq and Syria, particularly bombing the city of Raqqa, which is the ISIS state's headquarters. OK, can I be any clearer than that? And let's get that done. Let's send that message. And the way to back it up is not only bombing and some boots on the ground and allied troops as well, but another way to do that is make America's economy so strong that it's clear to everybody that we have the resources to follow through. You know, as I believe it was Henry Kissinger said to me, once you say it, you must achieve it. Good lesson for all of us in any area of our lives. Once you promise it, you must do it. And that doesn't mean it's easy. All I'm saying is, to try to tie this up in a, in a, in a pretty little bow, is that Kennedy in the early 60s, you know, and Reagan in the 80s, said it, did it, and followed through. And that is leadership. And that's one of the things that we're missing today. But optimist that I am, and believer in our democracy, I believe we will return to that. We will get back to that. Don't ask me when, but we'll get back to that. I want Brian to talk about growth. Growth, 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 right? Growth solves a lot of problems. It absolutely does. I, I want to acknowledge again the Californians, the Southern Californians that Larry mentioned is crucial in the supply side movement. It's not just Ronald Reagan. It's also two, two guys uh, who were really important back then, and that's John Rutledge and Chuck Cadlick. It was John Rutledge, who Larry worked with in the late 70s, early 80s, who was Reagan's first economic forecaster, found a, a, the Claremont econometrics. And John Rutledge's insight was that uh, 
You know, we're a little confused about by these Keynesians, by these tax cuts. They say, well, if you have a 10% tax cut, there's going to be 10% more money in the economy or something like that. No, no, no. He says it's going to be about maybe 100 or 1,000 times larger than that. Uh, because when you have a destabilized currency, having gone off the gold standard as the United States did in the 1970s, when you have tax rates that are rising up to 70% unindexed for inflation, you have a massive portfolio shift of investment choices out of the real economy into hedges against all these predations by government policy. You have hedges into gold, oil, commodities, land, durables. And John Rutledge said, in 1979 and 1980, ferried right to Ronald Reagan's desk, that if you cut tax rates and if you stabilize the dollar, the supply side policy mix, you will see a portfolio shift on the order of $10 trillion out of the tangible asset economy into the financial economy. The budget deficits that might result from that tax cut will be a rounding error, and that's the language he used. Are you going to run a $200, $200 billion budget uh, deficit every year? This is a $10 trillion portfolio event. It's going to be a rounding error. I mean, interest rates are going to go way down as everyone wants to bound into real investments. Now the tax rates are low and the dollar is strong and stable. And John Rutledge had his influence, but sure enough, he was eventually sent back. You're crazy. And he was the guy who predicted the bull market of the 1980s. I mean, really just a remarkable uh, story of prediction right there at the juncture of Ronald Reagan's decision to stabilize the dollar and cut tax rates. And then there's Chuck Cadillac, who was Arthur Laffer's uh, associate back in the 70s and 80s, uh, who said, who might have been the one, actually, who began to guide Paul Volcker himself towards following the price of gold. Uh, it seems pretty clear that beginning around 1982, mid-1982, when gold went up, the Fed tightened, and when gold went down, and the Fed may have put itself on a gold price roll about that time, it had really been hammering home in his own work. And once you cut those two things, tax rate cuts and the Fed effectively on a gold price rule, seven straight quarters of 7% economic in 1984. That is the only time in the history of that statistic that has ever happened. So if you want to talk about economic growth, you got to look at the heroic period of the Reagan years. You saw a recovery that will put hair back on your head. I mean, since 2009, we, I'm quoting It's a Wonderful Life, right? I mean, Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Stewart were good friends. Uh, the, uh, we've been languishing with one, two, sometimes negative growth since the trough of 2009. You might have seen Robert Barrow's editorial in the Wall Street Journal today. I mean, he was saying, actually, when you have a really deep recession, you're supposed to have a really big bounce back. Yeah, I mean, that's you, the gold standard of that phenomenon is 1983-84, when there was essentially nine quarters in a row of 7% growth. So that's what makes America what it is. I mean, that is the reason the Soviet Union could no longer finance the 13 countries it had taken over in the 1970s. That's the reason Castro was told, oh, we can't send the $5 billion every year because everyone is taking their money out of these hedge of investments, including petroleum and all that, and the Russians had all these mineral deposits, and they're just plowing it into the American economy. And that starved the communist empire, and sure enough, it gave up the ghost. John F. Kennedy's most famous address on tax rate cuts, his Economic Club of New York address of December 1962, spends its first 20 minutes talking about the history of American economic growth. The first 20 minutes of that speech, Kennedy was walking through the economic history of this country since the Civil War. And he notes that in that fantastic period of growth since 1865, the United States was preparing to rescue the world when it got in big trouble in the 20th century. What if the United States had not grown fabulously in the late 19th and early 20th century? Where would the world have turned in the face of all those world wars? Who knows? But the United States was prepared, undercut as it was by the high tax rate, destabilized dollar 1930s. Who knows where it would be? That's how Kennedy spent the first 20 minutes of address. It was an essay on economic growth. He came into office confronting problems with communism, problems at home with civil rights, and a slow economy, 2.5% growth per year. He said, we're going to get this country moving again, and we're going to solve all those problems. He stabilized the dollar, cut taxes, nine years in a row, 5% growth. So I'll just read you. Um, we were just at the New York Economics Club. Trump gave his uh, speech, and um, he's cutting. He wants to cut tax rates a lot, and I and some others have worked on that with him. 
I'm not here to make a campaign statement. You're going to vote for whomever you want. But it, it was the anniversary of that speech. Anyway, at the speech uh, to which Brian refers, Kennedy said, in short, it is a paradoxical truth that tax rates are too high today and tax revenues are too low. And the soundest way to raise revenues in the long run is to cut rates now. Now, when Rutledge and I were children in 1980, during the transition, that was basically our model. And as I said, we were raped and ravaged for that by the Rain Street media, but I'm still saying it. I'm here, whatever. The soundest way to raise revenues in the long run is to cut rates now. I might add, I believe President Reagan believed that too. I mean, he played the games and the numbers games in Washington, but never thought much of it. He just figured he'd do something right and the economy grows. It's going to work out in the end, and he was right. Um, Kennedy goes on to say, the reason is only full employment can balance the budget, and tax reduction can pave the way to that employment. This is JFK. The purpose of cutting taxes now is not to incur a budget deficit, but to achieve the more prosperous, expanding economy, which can bring about a budget surplus. And then, if you will, um, September 1980, during the campaign, President Reagan, then candidate Reagan, he asks in uh, Chicago, event Chicago, can you cut taxes and fight inflation at the same time? Well, I very much believe you can. And then he says, this is so great. Let me just read you something, quote, our true choice is not between tax reduction on the one hand and the avoidance of large federal deficits on the other. An economy stifled by restrictive tax rates will never produce enough revenue to balance the budget. This is Reagan's speech. Just as it will never produce enough jobs or enough profits, end quote. And then Reagan says, John F. Kennedy said that back in 1962 when he was asking for a tax decrease, a cut in tax rates across the board, and he was proven right. So to all the legions of Kennedys out there, God bless all of them, I just use those two paragraphs. You tell me if those aren't the same. 1962, 1980. And um, we've just tried to bring that to light. That's all. And finally, you know, regarding these models and so forth, um, you know, I'll repeat, I don't care what your damn model is. Just look at history. It's just like everything else in life, I, I think. The older I get, the simpler it looks to me. There's a right way and a wrong way. There just is. And, and that covers personal lives, family lives, economic lives, business lives, you know, business. Uh, you know, you don't check your morals at the door when you walk into the office. You still have to live uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good way, not a bad way. Well, I think economic policy is the same way. You get down to Washington, it's easy to lose that. But don't be a people pleaser. Just know that there's a right way and a wrong way. And Kennedy knew that, and Reagan knew that. And they're really the only ones that had that kind of impact uh, in my lifetime, I think. You might have some ideas about that. So maybe we'll take some questions now. The floor is open. And um, you can fire away. Go right ahead. So we do ask that you raise your hands. Uh, we are live streaming this. And the only way for the people at home to hear the question is if we bring a microphone to you. So there is a question right here. One second. You know, you look just like Congressman Peter King in New York. Did anyone ever tell you that? <laughs> I swear I thought it was Peter King. It's the, it's the hair. Group. Hey, uh, fellas. Uh, either one of you or both of you could address what you think is the greatest uh, body of resistance to recreating the experience of uh, JFK and, and President Reagan? We know what the resistance was in the Kennedy years, and it, it was a lot weirder than you might suppose. Um, number one, there were a lot of uh, business people in the United States uh, who were very much in favor of the marginal rate of the income tax standing at 91 percent, 100 minus 9, because an exemption from a 91 percent rate uh, is very valuable. It's much more valuable than an exemption from, say, a 28 percent rate. 
uh, one of Ronald Reagan's uh, associates, uh, adversaries, I guess, for a little while, Louis B. Mayer, uh, the studio director, for example, uh, in 1951 um, got a, a statute written into the law uh, saying that the lump sum income that he was getting um, would be exempt from regular taxation, and that lump sum was $2.7 million. So he only had to pay 25 percent, 791 percent. Um, if your business model is based on those kinds of loopholes, you don't want tax rates to be cut. <laughs> because then your business model goes poof and you have to really face entrepreneurial competition. The other group that Kennedy faced um, who were opposed to tax rate cuts were Southern segregationists. Southern segregationists, uh, Senator Al Gore from Tennessee, um, you know, uh, the Bird from Virginia, others, uh, the Mississippi delegation, uh, they were concerned that if there were robust economic growth, then Northern labor unions would welcome African Americans into the labor pool. Because when there is constant unemployment, the pressure was strong for whites in the North to reserve that unemployment for African Americans to become functionally segregationist. But if jobs were abundant, Northerners would just give African Americans jobs and they would not be functionally segregationist. And then the true believers would be the only adherents to segregation and it would be very easy to pass the civil rights laws. So the, that was the coalition that was lined up against Kennedy, and it was actually bigger than he had ever envisioned. He actually thought, oh, well, I'll come in here and just cut tax rates. That'll bring 5% economic growth. Everyone will love that. No, there are people who won't love that. Now, they would come around, of course, because those Southern delegations who like really wanted to keep the status quo racially going in the South, you know what they were doing by the 1980s? They were saying, you know what? Now that we've got a whiff of this economic growth, we like it. They became the bold weevil Democrats who said, let's keep cutting tax rates. Because if we're going to have an integrated society, why don't we all get rich? So, I mean, Kennedy paved the way. He showed us that economic growth, growth can be a salve. It can, be, it can bring us entrepreneurialism. It can bring us even racial harmony. And that was the wind that just carried that ship forward into the 1980s. You know, Growth and prosperity solve a lot of problems. It's, it's a subject unto itself. Maybe there's another book in there, I don't know. <laughs> but I just observe, I observe that during the bad times, and that includes today, but also when I was a kid, I started out in the 70s. I left Princeton in 1973, went to work for the New York Fed. It was a horrible recession. And you had another one after that, back to back. And people point fingers at groups and countries. We're seeing a lot of that now. Now, I have lots of my own opinions about all that, but the complaining, the insecurity, the anxieties, the crankiness, that's how we start our book. Americans are cranky today. You know why? because there's no growth, there's no prosperity, and there's no confidence. And so we play the blame game. All we have to do, as Brian said, is just keep your eye on the real ball, which is make the pie larger, and there's plenty to go around. But if you slice the pie, and those slices get thinner and thinner, that's when you have trouble. And a lot of the debates going on right now in American politics today have become pretty ugly debates which I don't like. And I think a key reason for that is we haven't had any growth. Middle income folk have not had a pay raise since 2000. You can check it, that's a fact. So they're angry. And when they get angry, weird stuff starts to happen. The other short answer to your question, by the way, sir, is, if you'll pardon my English, the left. The left. You know, the left. I'm sorry, but that's it. All right? You know, not even liberals. I love a good liberal. I mean, the left. It's a bunch of stressed out extremists. I don't know what they are. And all worried, running around about inequality. Inequality, right? We all start even at the beginning, fin uh, starting line by law. But where does it say in the Constitution we all have to end at the same place? That's about human ingenuity and drive and success and so forth. They're all different. They want it to be all the same. This is really, you know, this is, maybe it's only because I've been on an airplane for six and a half hours and I had to drive <laughs> up here for an hour and a half. But uh, I'm going to hung out to dryness. But I'll just tell you this. 
You want to look at the drive for, e for equality and the drive for redistributionism, okay? I have some real-world examples. Let's start with the Soviet Union. How'd that work for you? That's what they wanted. Everybody's the same, right? Except they weren't. The nomenclature would better. But just go back to that. Just look at socialism. One of the things I loved about the Bernie Sanders campaign, I know Senator Sanders, I've interviewed him many times on the, on the, on the CNBC show. Um, he is describing uh, places like Denmark and Sweden, which have jumped off his model because they're cutting tax rates and they're moving towards free trade, right? Seriously, this is a true fact. Not all those Euro countries, but the northern ones. And he used to quote Denmark. So I, you know, we all went and looked it up. These international tax rates, wait a minute. They're all, their corporate tax is lower than ours. So I'm just saying, this, you've got this group, and um, I don't think they want America to succeed. I don't think they want growth. I think they're a bunch of troublemakers, and they want mostly power, not growth. You know, because that's where those things usually end. That's all. Now I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for that, but that is my opinion. <laughs> let, seriously, let us not forget. <laughs> so, you know, let us not forget. Let me just stay with me for a second on the subject of the Soviet Union, okay? Ronald Reagan alone did not bring down Soviet communism because we had a whole history, a bipartisan history after World War II. It got harder and harder. You have different opinions, I get that. But Reagan's vision was, I don't want to really make a deal, I want to defeat you. Now. They were our enemy, and they had a system that was our enemy. So who do you choose? You had to make a choice. Soviet Union or the United States? Soviet Union and its socialist countries in its orbit, and the United States and its allies. Because the allies were at least democracies. They may have had you know, social democracies, but they were democracies. Freedom. In other words, they were free. And the Soviet Union was not free. So all this talk about inequality. Reagan was the guy who ended this debate. Just can never forget that. It's almost, it's so unfashionable in academia to make that point. I don't want to forget the Soviet Union. I especially don't want to forget Reagan's triumph over the Soviet Union because all my friends, my friends on the left, it just gives them yellow, angst, green. They just don't want to talk about it. You know, we didn't get there because we grew at one and a half percent per year. And we didn't get there because we were making side deals with countries that hate us, like Iran, pardon my French, okay? We didn't get there. We got there with a clear philosophy, and the guy never wavered. You know, that was Reagan's genius, if you ask me. I mean, they were destroying themselves, but, you know, he really stuck it to him, stuck it to him, and we never fired a shot, but, you know, I was in meetings as a kid, we, did, we had economic warfare with the Soviet Union. Reagan had constantly, we stopped them from pipelines, we stopped them from all kinds of energy deals, we stopped them from wheat, we stopped, you know, the farmers didn't like it, but we did it anyway because it was in our national interest. No more exports to these guys, no more subsidies, no more credits, and just tightened the noose and tightened the noose. And at the same time, we're exploding in growth. It's just all there. Just go to the history books. Do not forget that. That was Reagan. You know, John F. Kennedy was a fierce anti-communist and a true World War II hero. But it wasn't ready. It wasn't ready. When Reagan came, it was ready. And he just applied the final punches and did it in a very nice, calm, moderate way. Really, think about it. Never gloated. Never gloated. You know, among his last public statements, why were you such a great communicator? He said, no, you don't understand. It's not my communication skills. It's the ideas that I'm standing for. So ideas matter. Ideas matter. And these are thoughts that have quasi been lost. Seriously. Quasi been lost. We just don't think enough about this. It's very politically incorrect, which I love. Uh, income taxes are a tax on production. Why not abandon income taxes, get rid of um, underground economy, get rid of a uh, cash economy, and have a 
consumer tax, like a national sales tax, solely. Forget all the income taxes. We don't have to deal with lowering income tax brackets and all of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think a, a sales tax uh, would be uh, more economically efficient than an income tax. Income is kind of a fictitious category. Uh, the United States essentially had a sales tax when it had a tariff uh, before 1913, and that was coincident with greater rates of economic growth. Although, uh, it must be remembered that the tariff also involved a lot of agents of states, just as the IRS does today. It, in, it involves something like a police state that the acquisition of very large borders with Mexico and then Canada uh, made impossible. Um, so a, a, a sales tax would, would involve some libertarian concerns, I think. Um, especially if we can't repeal the 16th Amendment, which means we might get a sales tax and an income tax, which Europe has been struggling with and is certainly partially responsible for the dramatically lower rates of growth in Europe. Um, I do actually have a little bit of a, a rogue view. Let me call it an innovative view on this. I think if, uh, I don't think the United States should have a tax system at all, and I'm serious about that. Um, I think if the United States runs the world monetary system, which it very obviously does, if the United States has a very strong currency, then it can create that currency and people will exchange their goods and services for the privilege of using it. Um, I mean, the economists have calculated the United States could probably, if it runs its currency real well, produce $2 trillion worth extra, and that could easily fund the government. Um, no, I think the government should actually pay us. I think the government, if it runs the monetary system well, would not have to have any tax system that the very existence of the tax system, in fact, is proof that the United States is not running the monetary system well enough. So um, I think the United States should get very ambitious. If it has a tax system, it has to ask, how is it we are mismanaging the dollar? Because we must be if we have a tax system. So I'll just underscore the earlier part of that. You want to get rid of the income tax, and you want to substitute a sales tax of some kind. Um, you have to walk with me and work with me to repeal the 16th Amendment. You know, we're stuck with that. You know, as a young man, I was there when Wilson signed it, 1916. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a small point. You know, a couple of Republican candidates were pushing a form of a VAT tax in the election, and I did everything I could to stop that, sabotage that, say un, you know, ugly things about it, because they weren't applying the logic that you just heard. It's just, OK, fine. I would abolish the corporate tax, by the way. That's always been my first choice. But regarding the income tax, um, maybe we could recoup the revenues if we had a more confident management of the currency and bring all that money back to the USA. But you, know, you just look at Europe. Let history be your guide. Income tax, sales tax, that, you know, and it, it, they don't go down, they go up. In, in this uh, non-recovery, with Europe imploding, literally imploding, um, they they have a low business tax, but they've been raising all the other taxes. Sales, I mean, that's been raised. Income tax have been raised. The IMF, which should also be destroyed, uh, the IMF is made Greece raise its income tax and its sales tax? This is the road to recovery? So, you know, another bunch of money left Greece, right? All the uh, Greeks are fabulous. I love them. They're great businessmen and women. You know, billionaires. I used to consult with some of them in London. Oh, wait a minute. Why are they in London? <laughs> you know, these are the shipping guys. They're fabulous. You know, one of my best friends in New York is John Katsimatidis, who was a great story, started with nothing. He's Greek. He loves Greece. Uh, I want to go back to Greece and run for president of Greece and straighten that place out. I'm just saying, you don't want to go into that European trap. By the way, it's a Japanese trap, right? It's a Japanese trap. And while I'm on that subject, by the way, you want infrastructure spending, which is what Mrs. Clinton wants and you know, her little friends, uh, fine. But I just want you to remember that Japan has done, done nothing but infrastructure spending. Japan, take a good look at your map. Japan has basically paved over large chunks of the Pacific Ocean in the last 25 years. All right? But, oh, by the way, 
They have a corporate tax rate that until very recently was higher than ours. Their income taxes are higher than ours. And they're, you know, for you deficit debt warriors, uh, their debt to GDP is about 250 percent. Right? How about that? Now, they haven't grown since the late 80s. Oh, maybe there's another historical connection there. One more question. Uh, it's going to be that gentleman back there. First, a comment, Larry. I fully agree with your comment about the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, all the millennials and ex geners have no consciousness of the Soviet Union. And their very leftist professors, of course, won't tell them about it. So that's a, a tragedy that we live with today. But the real question has to do with um, you're in the media. Sorry? You're in the media. Yes. And when and why has the media become so slanted to the left? There's no more fair dialogue. Um, the system is rigged. You can't get uh, unbiased media coverage in any of the mainstream networks. And, and you deal with these people. So why did that happen, and is there any way to counter it besides the, the Internet, which is our, our only choice today for good information? Okay. So as, first of all, to the millennials, just send, buy it and send it to them. <laughs> just buy it and send it to them. It's a, it's, it's a quick read. Actually, they can do it on their, you know, goddamn machines, whatever they use. <laughs> you can get it there. What's it, what is it that you can... Uh, Tech. Uh, huh? Scrib. Scri whatever. You can, they can do it. I know they don't have, they have a tension span of a nut, but they can do it. There's a lot of history in this book, seriously. I mean, our pal John Batchelor, who's a radio, he's a dear personal friend, and he really taught me radio, and I'm sure you get him out here, but uh, you know, John said that this, we wrote a history book of the last 50 or 60 years through the lens of taxes, which I, I hadn't really thought of until he said it, but he's a great journalist. Now, sir, let me say to you respectfully, after you do all these things, sell our book, um, quit complaining. I love you, but stop playing the victim, okay? Here's why. When I went to Washington as a child in 1980, late 80, and worked for the Gipper, you know what you had? You had the Washington Post, you had the New York Times, you had the Wall Street Journal, but it wasn't as good. It had just been turning over to Robert Bartley. Prior to that, the Wall Street Journal opposed uh, Ray, uh, uh, Kennedy's tax cuts. It's in our book. Um, you're, we had ABC, CN, uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Yeah, but now you got all these other options. You know, Fox is one of them. Um, CNBC, it's a mixed bag, but you've got conservatives on CNBC. Um, you know, and all the ex-CNBC anchors that I worked with are also over at Fox Business. You got the internet and a kajillion websites, bloggers, tweeters. I'm a tweeter. You got all, we're, we're beating them. We got the, what, the Daily Caller and the, the Free Beacon and you got Newsmax and you got Drudge and man, we didn't have any of that stuff. Any of that stuff. I mean, you, 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 Reagan would you'd go to a news conference. He had a lot of news conferences with his you know, great humor and a nice way of presenting things. And you know, the, you look at the group in the White House, you know, press room. Look at them, man. There was not even a pretense. I mean, you know, that was the arm of the left. Now, a lot of those people are, you know, back, tanned, rested, and ready. But they're outnumbered now. Our side's got. We got a lot of counterattackers. All right, we got to, look, we sold this book, almost 1,000 copies each of the first two weeks. This is not a liberal book. And you got my friend Dan Coulter, and you got my pal Laura Ingram, and you got my pal um, Mark Levin, and Sean Hannity, who's been great, by the way, he's put me on his TV and his radio show. We got some serious ammo here. So you got to join the fun. <laughs> you, <laughs> All right. You know, you can just come with me. Tweet, radio, TV, come with me, and we'll just work together and beat the ever-loving daylights out of that crowd. That's what we will do. <laughs> so, 
So I think that's a great place to stop. Um, <laughs> they've been kind enough after this conversation to uh, sign books for you. So if you haven't already purchased one, we are selling them in the museum store, I think. After hearing that great conversation, we're all inspired to buy one, not just for ourselves, but for the millennial we're going to send it to. So I'm going to ask that everyone just remain in their seats for one moment while we take Brian and Larry through the doors and get them situated. And then staff will bring you in as well. The line will form um, over, I guess that's to your right, in just one moment. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.